Good evening, everybody. Welcome on this rather cold and chilly um, evening. Um, I'm Sue Hunt, and I'm head curator of this museum, the Museum of Sydney, on the site of First Government House. And as many of you will know, um, this is just one of 15 properties, in fact, that are managed by the Historic Houses Trust of New South Wales. Now, I'd like to welcome you to our special um, public program in conjunction with Cape Town Exhibition called The Collection, the Library and the Man. And we have a special privilege tonight um, in introducing Hans Hallen. Um, born in Durban of Norwegian parents, Hans studied in, in Natal, London and Rome. And for many years he practiced as a prominent architect in uh, Durban and was part of the practice Helen, Theron and Partners. But for our purposes tonight, we're very thrilled because in the 1980s, Hans was commissioned to design the new Brenthurst Library, which was finished in 1983. Now, this library houses the Brenthurst collections, of course, which include the rare Africana collection located on the family estate of the Oppenheimer family in Johannesburg. And for those of you who've already been to the exhibition, part of this collection uh, we are very, very pleased to have upstairs on display um, for the next couple of weeks. We have asked Hans, who's been involved also in the preparation of the exhibition, uh, to talk about the experiences of putting together this unique library from an architectural point of view, and also his involvement with a man who I'm fascinated with, Harry Oppenheimer. So can I ask you to put your hands together tonight and welcome Hans Helen. Uh, thank you, Sue. I'm, uh, I'm going to tell the story of getting this building built and the journey I had in, along that way where I met Mr. Oppenheim on many occasions. I've known him for, from 75 to 1990. And I thought I would start with the first line. And I here Nelson Mandela said of him, what you can read there. And it's, <clears throat> I thought to myself, well, what the, he's standing in his library, Harry Oppenheimer, in front of a painting painted by an anarchist socialist Australian painter. Uh, all painters, in my view, nearly all of them are slightly anarchist and slightly socialist. And he's in a library which, at that time, one would have thought, what would Mandela have to say about this? But his meetings with him and my own working with Mr. Uh, Mr. Oppenheimer, in regard to all the things he had to do outside the running of his business, led me to think that he was indeed some of the things, and all the things that Nelson Mandela said he was. So if anybody wants to doubt his judgment, you can write to him. But I think he, I found him an, an engaging man. My own background was one where one was skeptical of great wealth. One took the view the eye of the needle approach, and that men had to prove themselves, and in my eyes he did so. Now, in his collection, there are many things, wonderful things, and I just suggest a few of them, just to show the range. This is from 1748. This is the, the Lord's Prayer and Hottentot. This is, for architects here, if you want to learn a bit about construction, then I would certainly think that they found it there. The son, who are... Uh, Bushman in that area, that drawing is from about 1750. Here you see, um, on the opening of, of the exhibition, at least of the gallery in 1982, uh, that letter is part of a letter from Tolstoy to Gandhi. And all of the 200 guests at the opening got a copy of this letter. So you've got a, you've got a Christian pacifist on his, virtually on his dying, on his deathbed, writing, writing to a, a, a Hindu pacifist about non-violence. At the time of the opening of the exhibition, brilliantly chosen between the Soweto riots and greater violence and more troubles in 83, 84, 85. So I thought it was a deliberate choice that maybe these two had something to say to each other, even if you couldn't read it. <laughs> Some of you may not be able to read that. And on the right, there's an extract from the papers of Alan Payton. And somebody here might have looked at those and he wrote a book about him. Is Peter here? You might have seen that. So I did it for you. 
<laughs> okay. But those are the, the range of things. And if you've seen from the, from, for the South Africans here, the red hot poker, which there are 47 varieties, and you see that in the, in the exhibition upstairs, the, the, the Herschel family, husband and wife, drew those things. And for architects, and I'd be interested to know, and those who are onto high tech and photography, then here is how those were drawn. The camera lucida was used to get a much better image because drawing, you only draw what you think is necessary. Unlike the camera, it scans everything. So it's still today, people are still using that to draw, to paint birds. All those things, the books that you buy, are not photographs, but done by artists who have seen the things through this kind of eye. Now, this is the first drawing that Mr. Oppenheimer saw of mine. In 1975, the Institute of Architects in South Africa had a political uh, meeting, 200 or more, at least uh, about 500 delegates, to discuss housing. But basically, the context was a political situation where people were being denied access to living in the cities to live ordinary lives. So we had all sorts of overseas visitors, and it, the minister withdrew his, withdrew his uh, delegates, and, uh, and they came back anyway. But this drawing was in the report that I wrote on the, on, the, on the conference, and I outlined here all the problems that occur until you've got the housing, and all the things that people could help them with, create a small trading area, do this, and it was upgrading, which is going on for many millions in the world today. So that is what architects in 1975 and 76 were talking about. Now, he brought into being, many years before, something called the Chairman's Fund, which took a portion of the profits, and because they were such big holders in both De Beers and Anglo-American, they could take, without too much complaint, a couple of percent, and direct them to the causes that were needed, where government was, doing, was not doing things that should be done. So this is then a Technicon, which is really a tertiary educational institution in, 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 uh, in technology. And the, it's totally financed by the Chairman's Foundation. Uh, it's in a very awful township outside Durban, and I built it like, a, like a, 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 a hilltop town around a courtyard so that it could grow uh, over the years. Professor Bazzoli, the newly retired principal of the University of Witwatersrand, was directed by the Chairman's Fund to set the program going, and he got the best expertise to advise on this program. And it was done with the top level of professional advice and so far as planning was done. The planning, brilliant architect and the planner of the University of Cape Town, Julian Elliott, a man too good to have got a gold medal. One of the best architects I know is Julian Elliott, who has planned the Cape Town University campus for 25 to 30 years, and he's also helped us plan this one, and the University of Natal, we worked together on two campuses. And I built it around a courtyard, and around the edges, I, uh, we used simple materials, basically brick, local labor was encouraged, and we made, and all these corners are like this, they allow the expansion of the campus out to four or five times its size. But all of it is around a courtyard. And the courtyard, the idea of a courtyard, one of the great experiences of a courtyard in my, is that it's, a, it's the one building where you can contemplate your own building when you're in it. It's often not thought about that you, when you are in a building, you never see what you're in. It's a curiosity that architects hardly ever think of, but it's actually a wonderful quality that you should contemplate where you are. And a courtyard is one of the kinds of buildings that, can, that does that. Or the many-winged buildings of the Cape Dutch farmhouses where you could be looking out from your house, one room in it, and see the rest of it. Very nice idea. Well beyond architects, you usually think of that. This is the upper room, a fountain in the middle, and that covers a very big hall, but it's all part of the same structure. And here we see the architect caught was just giving instructions even to a <coughs> Zulu chief, and, uh, and he wasn't going to listen. As you can see on the right, I'm giving instructions, but you see on the left what he's saying is, I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> this is what he did. And that little medallion was given to all the visitors at the opening. I designed it. I created for them a Zulu motto, which is, knowledge is strength. And the institution went on, accompaniment of a band, and Mr. Oppenheimer then handing over the institution is going, for, uh, going well, running well, and into the Zulu nation. It's now part of the Technicons of South Africa. It, incidentally, they write, and they write exams there on a national basis, which is a wonderful idea because that 
gives you a sense of standard where you are. And here Mr. Oppenheimer is looking here. I had already been appointed to do his library, and you can see the anxiety on his face as he wonders what, the, what, is it, what I'm going to produce. And uh, the facilities are very good. This is the dining room with uh, art, a local artists, and some who works at our office produced the works on these walls. And all the furniture here were designed by us at our office, and they were manufactured in a factory five kilometers away, which created labor in the area. And the, the technological education institution is of high quality. And this is the lecture room, which we designed at that time, 80, 80, this is now 80, 81. We designed that, and it has natural ventilation and lighting in addition to the lighting. So it's, it's a comfortable but not expensive to run. Some views of the courtyard. And all this Oppenheim was seeing and wondering. I had done Hewlett's. Tongard Hewlett's is a mainly Anglo-American owned organization at that time. It's a sugar company as well as a brick company and a bigger and a, a property company. And it owns all these sugar cane fields down to the sea and over. And I, this is the head office for them. And down beyond the white building on the left, if you can see that building there, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the rich um, bush behind the behind the waves and the, behind the sands is Mr. Oppenheimer's retreat, built with no view of the sea, although he has fronted onto it and uh, conceived of in the late 60s by Stefan Ahrens, a very good uh, Johannesburg architect, and probably the one building that Mr. Oppenheimer really brief had, briefed for, not done through his company. So he has a wonderful home hidden away, quietly, rather large, but environmentally correct, and Hewlett, Tongard Hewlett's himself are an exemplar of how to do it well in that regard. And of course, in future times, all of this is going to be housing and offices, and I hope I keep my little temple there alive. This is a beautiful lake I created. Uh, being the kind of architect I am, an old-fashioned kind of architect, I did all the landscaping with the assistance of a very fine landscaper. Uh, architects, in my view, should do the whole story because landscape and building are... Or one. And uh, I can't say it reduced the peacocks, but there's a bold entrance. There's the, the kind of gardens we created, and that's York and Ripping, trained in Germany, Queensland, that is, the, yes, in Western Australia, and in Durban. And he did a dozen of gardens for us and worked in our office. And this is the interior of a building which was housed on this, these two floors, 200 people who were destined for a seven-story office building. They would be spread over that, and they have been in that building for 30-odd 30, 30 years now. This is, the, this is the design of the building set in the landscape. I used this kind of glass, which, made me, which let me reflect the horizon, so you could stand and see the building, uh, the, the building reflect the landscape in it. He knew that building well. He said he liked it. And I suppose he hoped he wasn't going to get a glass box down by the, at the bottom of his garden. I also was commissioned at that time, just after, as a result of a small competition, for a head office for BMW on the road between Mr. Oppenheimer and Johannesburg and the Reserve Bank in Pretoria. Now, I mean, from Johannesburg to Pretoria, and halfway along it's called Midrand. And the, the themes they ask for in the brief, quite interesting, I'll tell you this, because the brief that architects get is very often, you know, they, they don't talk about the character they want, but BMW said they wanted something which would reflect them as a company, they didn't want the name of the building, and they wanted to have something that has deep roots in the South African landscape and history. So in that area, there are uh, Mason, uh, the, the uh, archaeologist, had written a report on the round stone buildings of that area, historically. I had a plan of the, uh, the, the great crawl of the Dingaan and the Zulu chiefs. There it is. All I had to do was to put the departments in. He calls them regiments. You know, you could, we call them marketing and, you know, and finance. But that's really, the, the shape was dictated by other, other things as well, and the architects and the creative mind puts a lot of things together. And in this case, this is the freeway here, and that's the, the garden in between. Uh, in, and that, that garden is intended to reflect different aspects of the South African landscape. And here you see the, a view of, of Dingaan's crawl. 
and you see the BMW building. I'm not entirely sure that the head of BMW saw himself as Dingon, but, <laughs> but they liked that it was what it, what it turned out to be. And that's my first sketch of it, and that's the entrance. But then, on the, on, on the freeway, they had, uh, what, what signal could I put for them? I didn't want to put their insignia as such. But they had given me a, a marvelous thing with a Moira effect, two plastic sheets with circles. If you move them apart, it appears to move. And they were, a, BMW made airplane engines, which is where the, that shape derived from. The, the turning propeller. So I said, well, let's turn that into something. So my sketches for them in the presentation, I did that sketch showing what you drive past, millions of people over 20 years will drive past this building and see it. Hardly a fraction of that will see the building standing on their own two feet. The reality of freeways is hardly anyone, no, no, no architect from Joburg to Pretoria has thought that maybe you should consider what, what the effect is be not when you stand still, but when you move. And for that, a circle was a good device. And something which said, here we are, was this. So that's a nine meter high thing which was built by Shopfitter plus BMW's workshops. They manufacture and assemble many of the cars that you buy from them here. And, uh, and that was the size of it in relation to man. I also designed in the landscape an interpretation in sculptural form of a windmill. It doesn't generate any electricity. So, they, so those are the sort of things we were doing, a, a curving wall, the Drakensberg, rocks and things put it in it. Dark black local brick and slate from, a, from the biggest resistance quarries in the world. And then the artists would then paint interpretations of local life. And you see there's a famous painting by, by Delaunay in the modern movement called Homage to Blerio on his flight. And he's one of the great modern painters, Delaunay, and he took up that theme there. So anyway, that's how that's clever artists and architects can be, to possible boredom of everybody, but we love it. And that's at night. And now we'll hear what Mr. Oppenheimer thought he was going to get. I'll leave it to him to say a few words. He was recorded in 1984. And it's 1983. 84, yeah, after the opening. Well, the books had been housed at Little Brenthurst, which was the house where I lived when my father was alive. And there's a big library there. But to begin with, though it had got too small for the numbers of books that had been accumulated, and I began to realize, which I hadn't before, that if you were going to uh, keep a, have a serious library, that you needed rather special conditions, and as it wasn't good enough, simply to house it in a large room in a house, particularly with all the difficulty of having to clamber up to get books off the top shelf. And I felt that something more professional was, was required. Regarding the building itself, I'm quite interested to know what sort of client you were. Did you give the architect a fairly laissez-faire brief, or did you impose, as it were, your own personality and character on the building? No, Hans is a sort of person who, uh, it's very difficult to uh, persuade him to do what he doesn't want to do. <laughs> and, and that is just as well, because I think an architect should know what he wants, and if you don't like it, well, then you mustn't do it. But certainly the whole idea, which to my mind is very original, of the layout and the messing of this building, that, that is Hunts's. I mean, I knew naturally that I wanted a central hall. I knew that I wanted offices uh, for the librarian and also for the people running the Brenthurst Press. Uh, but anyhow, he came with this design, which I was delighted with. I mean, obviously it got uh, altered to some extent in conversation between us and also between, in conversation between him and the librarian because she knew from a technical point of view what she wanted. But the, the whole design, the overall look of the thing, this is pure Hans Hallen and I think it's very good stuff. I go home now. <laughs> but also there's a, Mar Marcel Graham was employed as an archivist uh, in 79 and uh, to look at the collection and to do what is necessary for it. He then decided that it, it couldn't stay, as he said, in the 
traditional library it was, where you had to climb up to get things. It needed to be done properly. And there was no better briefer and client than Marcel Graham. Because she, in fact, knew everything. She had been to uh, the best places for, for looking after things in her field. She'd been to the Library of Congress, which is one of the key places, and others like it. And she gave me a brief and worked with me right throughout the design. But at the same time, I had to then, with those remarks in mind, and the worry we would have had about what kind of building he was going to be, and he really was really quite a conservative, serious man, and he, would, he said to me, you know, that he, he'd wanted good materials, but he didn't, want to be, he didn't want to be too extravagant looking. He didn't want to show off too much with this building. He made it clear. And I was reminded by, you know, we keep using this term about people like him. Well, it's like the Medici, you know, they did these wonderful things. But Cosimo Medici, when uh, the, 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 one of the great Medici's, when he, uh, when he uh, was deciding upon his new uh, building in, in Florence, turned down a very w wild and bold palace scheme by Brunelleschi, the top man, you know, the big man in those days. And... Uh, and he got a more modest but very beautiful building, Karma. And uh, he uh, said, uh, he said that envy is a weed that should not be watered. And it struck me that uh, Oppenheimer's of that. So we tend to say uh, the more overblown rich man could be, the more foolish he really is. Because in a, in, in a, in a context like South Africa, it's even worse that you, you show off what wealth you have in the context of such poverty and such ambitions to do better. So I had then looked at the site where he lived, which is on, the, on, a, on a hill facing north over the newer suburbs uh, of, of the city, and behind over the hill, Parkdown Ridge it's called, was where the old, uh, the, the initial great uh, uh, um, lords of the mining world stayed. But um, Ernest Oppenheimer purchased this house designed by Baker. Now, Baker uh, was an English architect who came to South Africa and, uh, when, at the end of, after the Boer War. And he had opportunities there, as he had in England also, but he had great opportunities. And he observed in the Cape Dutch buildings, the farmhouses, he recognised in them what British critics in the mid-19th century had said, that they were the first new housing type of quality since Palladios. And it's true. They are, really are. If you visit them, they are um, remarkably well-conceived, great uh, clarity of vision in their construction, and he learned from that. And the features are not to be seen on the left, but the cross plan, the, the court, so you can sit in that room at the top and look across the other one, and there's a, a space place uh, below, and so he, when, when he built this, he had this in mind. But Ernest Oppenheimer bought this in the 20s. And then in 1955, Harry Oppenheimer moved into it. The gardens had been done originally. The main form of them was done by Baker, who did all his gardens and all landscapes. And all the architects I've ever known or any good do their own landscapes. Not the detail of the planting, but the overall form. Because trees and plants are solid. And architecture is the sculpture of solid things which people have to, <laughs> we have to stuff people into, but that's actually what it is. So, and in the garden was this, Renoir, and these sort of things. That's the garden that over there. And here you'll see the, the portion of the house. Um, this is uh, Mr. and Mrs. Oppenheimer, Harry and Bridget Oppenheimer, in later years, but sitting on a terrace in, in that opening there, where in all seasons in, 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 in Johannesburg, because it faces due north, because no winds can get in there, there isn't, they wouldn't want to buy a deck on any grounds. It's, it's able to be safe and secure and pleasant. So they, this is a typical Cape Dutch building, farmhouse, which had a simple form and a clear entrance. And that entrance, that is for, for the, that, that is owned by the Oppenheimer family. Uh, it was originally the roads farm estates, and that's where the, they get their wine. So if you had a meal at the Oppenheimer's, you'd get wine from that farm. And then this is, you see, the context of, this, of the Renoir, which has impressed me greatly. It's six foot high exactly. Renoir wanted to do 
he wanted to have a classical size of sculpture, which he asked his friends to, to measure the, mo the costs in Paris to see how big they were, but he didn't want a, a figure like that. Where he, said that he, he said he didn't create that. But it wasn't he who, who did the molding in clay, it was a young Italian who did that. So I had wanted to see that associated with a new building. I'll tell you more about that. Here's the detail, and here's a, I photographed the detail of the drapery. And Renoir was painting with great difficulty at that stage. He could only hold, he had arthritis of terrible scale, and he could only paint with it like this. He, had a, he couldn't hold the brush, and nor could he actually even touch the, the clay. So this young man, and he would then have to poke a stick if he didn't like what this young sculptor did. But he did paintings like that in the, into his 70s before he died, all his whole life. And instead of Renoir, that he, good times and bad, in war and his own unhappiness and, and illness, he never did an unhappy painting. For those who expect painters to always do something unhappy, if they are unhappy or if the country is unhappy, it's wrong. You can do great beauty because that's where you, where you start. Now this is in the gardens. This is my own little effort at Cape Dutch on the right there. I thought I'd get a B minus for that if I were at university. Um, and this is the folly. The pool existed. I cleared away some buildings and we decided we'd have a great mural there. So, and that's Baker's little feature for the radiation to the pool. And there's four leading South African painters. Andrew Fester on, on the left and Oppenheim on the right are discussing this great big mural which is based on the 20 Impressionist paintings in his home. Now, to the design. The, this hilltop, there were really two sites. One near the, uh, the house on the left and one down by the freeway, the Howling Freeway. And I had to do, do two tests of the sites before I did a full design. And this is the story of of how I got to the forms. I had visited Delphi. I had been interested, as many architects in South Africa had been, as a result of, of um, South African attempts in the 30s to look at how the Greeks cited their temples and how they approached them and what the movement towards them was. And here you see the path up to Delphi. Is that route like that? An S bend up. And along the path are these fine little buildings. But they all stand. This is the French Reconstruction but it was in our School of Architecture library, and I used it from there. And here you see the dotted around of the path, these little buildings, and they all are little treasuries from little towns where all the people coming to, to uh, Delphi would come from, and they would have their own places. And that's how it came. That's, and there was one, we, I visited an island called Sifnos where I did some measurements for a, uh, the, how they located their buildings there, and I see a Sifni and has a treasury there. I thought then, there should be a main room, a great generous main room, in a time when today when nobody wants to have rooms, they have spaces. I wanted a room, you know, which had a, a thing, that was like your room. You could recognize it as a room, not something to escape from onto a deck. And so I had, a, my first concept was that, a little sketch there, together with, with um, these islands. Of, of, and because of what was required really, that all the documents, had to be kept at a fixed temperature, out of light, in f folders and in boxes, and with limited access to them. So that's one kind of treasury. Then there were paintings and prints and things that required another kind of space where you could more easily go in because you could put the pictures behind glass or you could have them in safe folders and different temperatures. So I thought of that too, and then you had other documents. So I, I, I then started to think of the sort of things that architects do, like, like an artist, which is really what one tries to be. How do you deal with junctions and connections? And how do you make them? And of course, I thought back on the Greek temples. And then I did some sketches, thoughts about the form, thought to think how it could look, how the spaces could be. And then, of course, by that time, I had now tested it out. Uh, I did some early plans. I played around with the junctions to show how that worked. And if you had looked at it, I saw a film at that time of, of a great sculptor uh, doing a, f a figure. And he would make the arms in, in plaster of Paris from clay, and he would make a few arms. And then he would uh, 
fit them out of the body in different ways. So you could see them. It's a bit like photographers lining up people to take a photograph of them, pose them. Because basically there's another truth that architects often forget is that uh, buildings stand still. It's the people who moved. You know, we still, we think, <laughs> because we've got the movies, we think that we sit still and the building moves. But we actually experience things about buildings as a result of moving around them, which is really a classical view. So I, I, I started with this. I then made a series of models, or we made. Um, the freeway is here, and it's at the same level as the site. And there are 100 decibels. It's enormously noisy. Howling, as we used to call the howling freeway. So we had to now get rid of the noise, make it pleasant to come to the building, not see the, or feel that, you, the, that you're next to a freeway, but it was one advantage of this access rather than high up is that it's near the gate. So that visitors who are coming to the library need not go to the, through the whole estates. So I did these. This is the freeway. That's the low wing. Another low wing. And then these three forms that I have here, they form the exercise that we made in designing the building. One of the ideas was to enter on a, make a powerful corner rather than enter in the center. And I had done quite a lot of buildings with corners, entry, and I did these sketches like this. And, and here's an inside view looking out to see so you could look at the other the gallery. And here's a way in and how the building sits on top of that, the roof sits on top of that. And here you see the, the, the approved site plan. The gate is on the left. That's the driveway you're going through up to the big house. That's the way Mr. Oppenheim would come every morning, down this way, and along a long a long uh, view here, twice the length of that, that he would drive along to see the building. And visitors would come this way, uh, park there, and go into the library to be met opposite you by a big strong statement. So you'd arrive here, you go down this bold stair to the library, and you'd see that big thing there, and you'd have no view of the road at all. And we had a very busy fountain, so you, you're quite happy to put up with the sound of a fountain but not with a howling freeway. So I introduced a noisy fountain, which then dampened the sound of the freeway. And then these, here you see these one, two, three forms. That's the, where the documents are kept, the manuscript room. It stands like that. It's a double story. It has very thick walls, insulated, with a very fixed temperature. And then I made these four legs, all out of granite. They look like granite stanchions holding up the building. But each one is engineered internally to, to shape it to different direction, as you can see. And here you see a, mo a bigger model. There you see a model of the steps. Here you see a model of the manuscript room. And we allowed the rooms, the offices would be here. They could see past that, see views. And that's how it's been formed. Now, if Mr. Oppenheim comes along in the morning, he sees then through this light colonnade, in the early morning he would see this framed view of the building. Or walking, you see that view. Closer, you'd see that view. And here you see the, the form of the buildings. Those two are visible. The big sculpture where I got a very good villa there, but I, that's where the Renoir lady is supposed to be standing. And that's the entrance. And the steps down. That's in brighter sunlight. The materials are already... The, the choice of materials was I decided that white... And the high filter is really difficult with a bigger building. The, the sunlight is very brilliant. Unlike the camp where you, had, you have dark winters where the white helps you, in high felt it's really quite good to have, as they did many stone buildings, and darker, because it's the, it, the brilliance of the sun is, just makes it work for you. And I use a very fine local brick. It had to be hand uh, sorted from dark, to give me that brick, and we had some travertine in, in rows around it. And that window there is a window to one of the offices of the, um, of the director. And that's the other, the other office, office for the editorial office. All this is in travertine. The landscaping, to tuck it into the landscape, the gates beyond, to make it pleasing when you looked, sat in those offices and looked out. This is, this is the landscaping that Jochen Ripping did with us. And then here you see those three windows, three op two openings. I'll, I'll show you later, but those are the, that's Mr. Oppenheimer's room, and that's the little committee room. And then that bank grew up rich, 
in full, and you could not see or hear the road from here. This is the entrance to the uh, gallery, to the, to the, um, and this doors, uh, I thought that we'd make this, the thing is of a transvaal granite, which is what they call flamed. It has a rough, rough texture. What they do is cut the, cut the, they cut the granite, and they run, uh, they heat the surface, and it, parts would come off to give you a rough texture. And then the inner, the inner way is smooth, and the door sits in there. I'll tell you more of the door. That's the door. I thought that it would be like, like a curtain. You would draw a curtain there, and you see that's where the door is. You go straight in. I have a photograph of me taking a photograph there, and you see, I see myself. The, and I'll tell you more about that. And then at the door on the left, you have a place to put out your ash, which will be a cigarette, and stop smoking. And I, it was enough, because it's such a quality thing that the artist made, I, I nearly took up smoking so I could actually put a cigarette out. Um, this is the door that you see as you come down the steps. You see this bold door, and you see the glow uh, of the uh, uh, marble, that is, an inch and a quarter marble ring above there, which is that size, one and a half feet diameter marble, about which I will tell you shortly. And that at night, it's lit from behind, and you see that at night, so you also have glowing light from it. And that's now, we've now walked down the path, you've opened the door, you've turned back to look at it, and you look into the, you've been through that experience. I've now got to explain to you that I, I sought to, the most suitable form for that central volume. The first thing is to say, well, what about a dome? But the, the dome has deficiencies. And, of course, you want to go for a square plan to go to a dome. You have to do, as they were done, you had to go up and create what they call a pendentive. And then you have another leap up. It can work, but to have a groin vaulting, cross vault, is what I came up with. It has two great advantages. One is it gives you a marvelous volume, better than a dome, and also gives you external and internal elevations to let light in or to, for appearance. So you actually have... Unlike a dome, which got that, we have these four, and then as you can see, this is the groin. This is now looking, as you've arrived, you look into the left, you see a view through the architecture of gardens, you see where the book stacks are, and you see through to beyond. And you see these great light standards, which are about the diameter of those, to give you an idea of the size, it's also about one and a half meters. And no, there are no downlighters, no spotlights on the ceiling. All lit, as one should do, is to light your ceilings. If you want to make a volume good, you light your ceiling. It's an old idea, but it's been done for as long as people have it light in, in, in rooms. If you want light to spread in a room, you light your ceiling. It's uh, difficult to say that we have people putting hundreds of little things in the sky. So these, and you look back the other way, and this is what you see. And you see then a great big painting, which is really like a wall, which I, I created a wall uh, for a mural and we, we, I'll tell you the story of that as well, how to go about getting one. And these guys through to the offices, that's the door you've come in. And the sort of thing that we do as architects, maybe that will, is how do you deal with an arch to becoming a section of a dome going on to a lower area. You then up do dozens of sketches like this. This is what I did. And we sat with that to create the solution of the right way of doing that and then coming out into the next volume for a higher ceiling there. And here you see a bit of that effect. This is a column in the library, bookstack area. And here, uh, the, the other exit, that way you see through to the, the, the director's offices there and the uh, assistant director on the left. And here you see out of, the, out of the gallery, you'll see back to the villa sculpture, you see the other building turned towards you, so you at least can contemplate your own buildings, rather than a flat wall going away from you. And here you can look out of that and you'll see the big door. And th these are these sketches where you've seen those, but this is the sketches for the gallery. I had done a, a sketch like this or two, and we'd made models of that, and then we made a, the gallery. Here you see the gallery, which is on two floors, has uh, paintings and drawings and folders of material, and you could just glass display cabinets on both levels, and some of them wonderful maps and drawings that are large are housed there, and they are displayed from time to time. 
This is the room in which, and perhaps that is why Mandela thought well of Mr. Oppenheimer additionally, because at the time when he became president of South Africa with his new cabinet, how were they going to, they needed really to come to terms with the economy and how to go about it in a responsible way. So Mr. Mandela suggested to Mr. Oppenheimer, can't, can't I come with my colleagues and you come with your leaders that you think we should talk to and we talk, in a, we just talk, we talk about the problems we are faced with in governing and you are faced with in business and we'll see what happens. And Mandela said, I don't, I, we, but both agreed it should be on a neutral site and Mandela suggested the site. So in that room, in the story that Marcel says that they were really stuffed into this space. It wasn't very designed in that brief. Really. It wasn't in the brief, Mandela meetings. Okay, and they sat in here and they, so those they became a, the Brenthurst group, met many times in sorting out probably quite heated debates, nationalization, oh God knows, I can only, you can imagine them, but that's where it happened. And that's where the goodwill may have been increased by the understanding that they were going to st stick with the game under that government, and they were going to help in what way they could. And this is another view of that gallery. And into, this is Mr. Oppenheimer's room. I showed you those strange angled walls earlier, the order. This now view, you sit in that. The freeway really is 25 to 30 meters away uh, on the left. I got the permission of the road authority to put a, a large earth berm uh, beyond the boundary which assisted us with sound reduction. But still, that's, so he, he sits at his father's, Ernest Oppenheimer's desk to write, looking out into that. And in the study, little study room for eight or ten people, uh, you, you sit in that room. Next to you are some wonderful uh, display of stones and other things, and precious things. And that's the effect created. And here you see a painting of Byron, Oppenheimer's desk, his father's desk, and the view out. And here you see how the library really works. Uh, here, the, 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 our study carols, and with the shelving, and we agreed that the shelving should never be higher than this. You, co you don't want to hold a folio that, work, that weighs two kilos or more, and it's actually 300 years old, and then lift it down if you're weak and you drop it, that's, then it lost its back. And the, even old books do what they, those archivists say, uh, they, the restorers say, they fall out of their backs. The weight of what they contain drops down. So they have to be repaired. So no, nothing, nothing higher than that and nothing below the knee. It meant, uh, and really that's, that's the limitation set. And the other thing about this gallery this, uh, this library, is that it, there's room enough for all the expansion they need because the, this kind of collection expands by quality. They have another, the old library, so if you buy, so if you buy some more valuable documents or books, then at the bottom end of what you have, that goes to the old library. It's not as if you're always buying the latest thing they're publishing. You go into the auctions and feeling out so that the, the library can take hundreds of more years of stuff in a way, but it's quality. So it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a library which is going to get, with purchases, will get better and better qualitatively, which is you know, unusual. Because the briefs we usually have are the opposite. They make it as big as possible. And then this is, a, this is we, we put these in, several of these uh, designed. If you were staying over, you're studying there, staying overnight, then we would have the lid would come down, you can put your stuff and work there, and then at night it would be secured. I don't know whether they still use that, Peter. All right, oh, well, that's a very good device. So that means that you are not embarrassed as a, as a scholar to call for the, for, the, for the books to be fetched for you. You know, you can, it's, they're locked in position for you overnight. And this, any director of, a, of any institution will know that uh, tidiness is a failure. I mean, anyone who's a tidy director is a, is a, is a failed director. So this is the, these are the rooms which Marcel sits in, and out of that is the view, and these are where the documents that come, as, as they come in from, uh, to, to look at, they're, they're in, on shelves, they don't get light, 
and then they'll, they'll spread out of there, and that's where you present them with the light that you have. The, all these up lighters and things were detailed and designed in the office by us. And then this is the, I only have one slide of this, but a lot of the work there is restoration. Once you have restoration of paper, a, a, a torn book, pieces come off it, they can restore the paper so they can see that you've restored it, but at the same time it looks perfect. And they do all of that sort of thing. It's a high level of skill in there. And uh, wonderful people doing that work. Books or anything. And of course they all, all have to be, anything that's purchased has got to be taken in and, and fumigated on the way in on another entry, which I don't, I'm not sure I showed you that. But, the, but that, then I come back to the main, main room. I talk about the glass, the, the, the discs. These I, I had said in the initial design of Mr. Oppenheim, he loved the whole thing. He said, but now we, what are you going to, are you going to add? I said, I thought, I suddenly thought, I, the way that took me away. I said, alabaster, I said. It sounded terrific. Well, I, 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 when I asked around to the stone, made, stone firm supply, none of them could give me any big piece of alabaster. And when they get, what they gave me came was sort of green. So when I went, I went on a trip to Europe, and I went to, um, um, uh, near Carrara, there's a town called Pietra Santa. Now, Pietra Santa, uh, I suppose, uh, is a holy, holy, uh, holy stone. has the biggest collection of stone, for example, from around the world. At that time, when I went there, that's the place to go. To go to there. And I went there, but I, couldn't, I still couldn't find anything. I was very embarrassed because I had to have these five discs. We were looking at something rather inferior. And then as they were laying... I had selected a white Portuguese marble for these edges here. And I arrived on site one morning early, and they were holding them up to, to work, to measure them or something, and then the sunlight came right through them. And then it was a eureka moment, I had it. They were on site, and they, uh, well, they didn't, but that size, but that's what they had. So that's a Portuguese marble that's about that thick, and that gives that wonderful light. Now, we dealt with a lot of artists, some of them were kind of in-house artists, and, uh, and I now take you to the doors. Now, I had done, in my career as an architect from about the 1960 on, low relief, large low-relief murals at the Harbour Terminal in Durban, huge. I'd done doors like that one on enamel for a church, four of them. I had got the, for a, a convent, I'd done the main door. I hadn't designed it, but I had conceived of the idea, but then I got an excellent man who had helped to restore the artworks of Cologne Cathedral. And he made that. That's enamel on copper. And a device that we thought of was when they left the old building to come to the new building, we took the key of the old building, cast it into resin, and put it in the handle. And that window I designed, but I got a good friend, Jim Hall, a wonderful Slade-trained New Zealand artist who lived in Durban to make. And this is uh, for a you know, modern swinging architect to live in a sp Californian Spanish, this is where offices were. This is how the, uh, with a pool, and this is Andrew Fister, the artist, Duncan Ross, what was a job architect, and Monica Gerber is here. I thought that'd be good, Monica. And this is, you can see these drawings were being done in the steam age, before computer. Uh, you know, they, long before, you know, we, so that is, and that's the studio we had, and we'd worked in there. And we had, our office meetings were out in the sun, and we, that's where Mr. Oppenheim and his wife had lunch. <coughs> and that's the kind of strange Californian Spanish building on, on which door schedules in my first year, 1949, I had drawn. So I had a feeling of the window. And here you see them, all, all these people are at work. Uh, this is making the doors. And here you see the architect doing hula hoop while it's all being done. <laughs> Typical employer. Now, come back to the, the doors. I had liked the doors. I'd liked the sculptural work. And Andrew had as well. And we decided that we'd do a proposal. And he would make it, really, uh, from a, what they call a maquette. A small made thing. And that's the maquette of the front door that Andrew made. It's about this high. Beautifully made. Sort of thing if you framed it, you could get a good price in a good gallery. And then he did the inside. 
and then up, I took them to the, to the Milkwood, where Mr. Oppenheimer lived in the, by the coast, and he came to the office to see them here. And then that's the, that's the door of the gallery. And you see us, as you see how big it is. These are the maquettes that we made, Andrew made. And that's the maquette that Andrew made in clay, a sample, which he then polished and uh, in the studio, in the office. They're all done there. <laughs> and here you see it being made. On the right, the second stage. What you do, you make it in clay, or whatever you can do. Then you cast over that in plaster, and then you cast again to get again what you had. And there it is, male and female mold, they call it. And there's the male mold ready to go to the casting, uh, gem casting yard to make. Here he's working with clay and lead sheet. He got thin lead sheet to help make the, the, the folds. And here you see bits and pieces of the, 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 the man mold going off the gem. And here you see him working in the studio. There's a bit of lead. Here you see him working with the lead. And here's uh, Renoir and his Italian man doing it for him. They're assembled then before they go to the casting yard. In the back, this is all the back of our office. And then, uh, then they go, they're sent off and then they come back. And they're polished. And here's Andrew uh, buffing them up, buffing up the, the uh, pieces. And then we delivered them to Johannesburg. That's a piece buff, buffed. They delivered on site. And now they're going to be erected onto, onto the doors. And here they are. It's gone in. It's erected. It works. Another couple of shots of it. And there's a memory, memory of the two maquettes I put on the same slide. The inside, the outside, and the inside. And looking back, that's what you see. All that. And Eduardo Villa is, is South Africa's, I suppose, probably oldest practicing sculptor even today. And he's a wonderful sculptor. And uh, I knew him well for many years. In fact, he and I were in, uh, in Italy together, and we went to um, Pietro Santa together. And uh, he could confirm that there wasn't any marble you could see through easily. And uh, so he, we then saw we would get Edmardo to put forward some suggestions for Mr. Oppenheimer. He then turned that into an exercise for himself, Edmardo, to make another series of sculptures. So but before we came to see him, he already had something he had made three or four. And there they stand, waiting. And then these were then the two ones, the two, the two sculptors that Mr. Oppenheimer liked best and which I thought were good for the site were these two. And then eventually he chose that one. Eduardo then finished that and delivered it and placed it in position. And it's, it's sited in such a way which is the law of sighting or anything, as you want to see, it could be seen this way. From inside the gallery, you could see it. Now, Leonard French is a great Australian painter. And uh, I, it, the time came when I uh, had to say to Mr. Oppenheim, look, where I was at dinner now with somebody we saying, look, I, I just want to say we must have now make a choice of artists to do the mural. I have the wall in mind, the size, everything. But who should we do? Should we ask three artists to do that? He said, you know, you have nice voices. You know, Mr. Holmes, I, I have an old friend, you know, in Australia, Leonard French. I think we'll I'll get him over. I just ask him um, what he thinks. He, we, we don't have to like what he does. So this, um, he had been to Australia. He had bought a lot of Australian paintings. In fact, his, his uh, home in, by the coast has got a lot of very good Australian paintings of your moderns. Very, very good collection. And he had bought 10 years before this, or more, a Leonard French. Leonard French paintings are rich, great, full of mythology and meaning, deeply um, and very unpopular in terms of the, the, the people who want to do much more kind of flash things. He's a very serious and very, very nice man and a good player. So he, he, Mr. Oppenheimer brought Leonard French from Australia to stay and to visit. He came to the office and we spent a couple sessions together about as to my expectations of not of what the painting could do, because that is his job. He, I'm not going to tell him what to do, but I could tell him what my colours were going to be and what materials were going to be. 
And I had a, I have a, I, in the Norwegian background, there are a lot of muralists. That, and or any mural has got to relate itself to the building it's going to be fixed in. It's not a thing which you buy on an exhibition and say, I'm taking home this one here, it's got a big looking nice on our wall. A mural is intrinsic to the place it is. So it has to look at where it is. So um, Leonard French came, he was well, three weeks, toured the country, saw everything he wanted to see in times that were really quite difficult in South Africa. And uh, we had much, much fun with it because he was a man who wear khaki outfits and things like that. And, uh, and he and Oppenheimer got on famously. They, communicated, they wrote to each other for 10 years regularly. They were, they, they were great friends. So this multimillionaire, capitalist, anarchist, socialist painter were hugely good friends, really good friends. And then one day I got a call from... Uh, this is a kind of painting that Leonard French had... That, this isn't the particular one, I couldn't get a copy of that, but this is the kind of thing that Oppenheimer had a painting of. Um, deeply, uh, re almost religious feelings and uh, deep, deep felt actions. And now he sent over a maquette, which is a, a picture of the painting. And Mr. Oppenheimer, I invited to dinner, I didn't know what it was about, because I hadn't heard that he got the painting, but he said to me now, he, after dinner, he pulled out an envelope and he said, this is what Leonard just sent, you see? So I, he said, and what do you think of it? Now, this is a big thing. You know? I looked at it, I thought it's good. I, we must have that. Now, I'm being an architect, you see. We are selfish people. Because you know, we would like the artist to reflect <laughs> our buildings in his painting. But what is good about it is what it was, it picked on human themes in South Africa. The idea of conflict. And all of those things which you'll see. That's what finally the bodies, all of these, the, the circles, the balls as it were, those are human beings and there's some sort of break in the middle and you couldn't really know, but there was fire and brimstone and as in fact South Africa was at that time. And he put that into a painting. I said, great, let him come and do it and then, oh, eight months later, the painting came. In time for the building. And he had, he'd had it in, he'd done it in six cedar panels, interlocking, beautifully done, absolute Crafted. I mean, the highest level of craftsmanship, just in, in making that as we're making the, the panel. And we rushed down when it came, it, it mailed, came, came delivered by uh, uh, to, to the near the site. Um, uh, we went down into the place where they were. And we were ripping off the covers and taking one at a time. And all of us knew this is going to be okay. This is a, a rather uh, too light a print of the painting. It's a it's a it's a form of a bridge. That's either being destroyed or built. It has the eastern Transvaal landscape. The Transvaal landscape. You have fire and, as I said, brimstone. You have people conflicted at all levels. And it was how he saw South Africa at that time. And this is a better print of it. And you could, I made this print an extra one. You can just see a faint line. It's these panels. And And then, it's a part of the detail. There were elements of the cross in there, of, of, and of sacrifice. There are details of the split between the two sides of the bridge. In composition, it picks up the gold of the circular window above, and in, in, in classical terms of the early paintings, it's a triptych. It's a three-piece painting. So the middle is, a, is, is on its own, as it were, a painting to which the sides contribute. So it's a, a wonderful, wonderful painting. So, you know, it could be, you could visit such a kind of painting in an old church in Italy, a triptych telling some sort of story. So it's a, and then we mounted it on beautiful, on brackets, exactly the, it made it exactly the size it was designed for, and then, at the opening of the building in 82, 84, um, Alan Payton, who had become a good friend of Mr. Oppenheimer, uh, made a speech where he talked about the times we were in. He talked about 
how good it was for Mr. Oppenheim to do all the things he was doing in his life through his companies and on his own to benefit others and to help the change of South Africa. He backed political people who would go to Parliament, Helen Sussman, people like that were all backed and aided by Harry Oppenheimer. He even had a retired head of the church, Methodist church, give him a job while he waited to go to Parliament and he became and he came in charge of labour relations in Anglo-American and eventually became a politician and then left, retired from become the man who organised as Tutu's assistant, but he organised the, the wonderful commission. So that's the kind of man Oppenheimer was then. He would have these people. But now Alan Pavin says all of that, he's very charming about everything, he's tough about the country, but he's wonderful about Harry Oppenheimer and, and he's very charming about the gallery, but then he says, he turns to the painting and says, I hate that prophecy. This is one thing I don't like, he said. I don't like that prophecy. And that's, well, that's the way he was uh, when he spoke. And then Oppenheimer stood up and he said, well, he thanked, um, thanked him very much. But uh, he didn't see it as a prophecy. He saw it as a warning. And of course, that's very good. That's exactly what it should be. Any, the great paintings of, uh, are are those which have metaphors. And I, I put this down. I, I wrote to him on his 90th birthday. Uh, he lived in 92. I wrote to him and said, what, what can I say of a man who, whose life has been about gold and diamonds and who does, and then build his library? So I did this quote from the book of Job. Job, I think you say here. Yeah, man sets his hand to the granite rock and lays bare the roots of the mountain and gems of every kind meet his eye and brings the hidden riches of the earth to light. But where can wisdom be found? And where is the source of understanding? What is striking about Mr. Oppenheimer, whenever I saw him, just the two of us, or two or three of them, he, would, he was an inquisitive mind. He was interested in everything. He, he, he asked questions of himself. He said to me, Hans, you know, now, what, do your ideas, basic ideas, change in your working lifetime? As an architect, do you change? Because I looked at my papers as a student at Oxford, and I looked at them the other day, and I found that I... And basically, I had to change that much. I think that about the things that I first thought were the right thing for me to do, I think about, haven't changed. But as those are the conversations we had, and that told me something about the man. That was the kind of man he was. Thoughtful, a man who was a scholar. And in his latter years, he would go down to the library many times in a week, followed by his dog, and he would ask of researchers there what they were doing, ask of the people, there, and he would then do his own in his little small library. Um, I investigated how big should a library for such a man be. I'd seen a few, and I'd been to one of uh, Urbino. And there was the Duke himself had an office about this size. All small, all modest, but very nice and comfortable. So, I thought, well, that's, that's it. I'll make it small and comfortable. And there are his own collection, and his own collection of Byron. He had a one, and that told me that he was also really a romantic. And I also think he was romantic from another point of view. June asked him one day, which particular uh, like, uh, jewel that he liked, it was a sapphire, what was it, diamonds? And he turned to June and he said, a pearl. <laughs> a pearl to me was amber. Those are things that living matter makes, living things make. <laughs> and it's an amazing thing, isn't it, that it comes, a pearl comes, that's a romantic mind would say that through overcoming a real problem, which is what the oyster has, he creates a thing of beauty. And that's the kind of mind he was. So he didn't find any pearl. He wasn't a pearl hunter, but he, he liked the pearl best. So I commissioned Andrew to do a painting of, of a portrait of uh, Oppenheimer. I wanted it to be small. I said, it has to be set in the landscape, a fierce sky I would like that, something of its time. And he did a few of little sketches, and he did one with this strong jewel. And uh, a good friend of mine, Alice and mine, um, Zach De Beer, a director of Anglo-American, said, that's a wonderful portrait, because that's when the tough, when the going tough in business, or when you, you, you when the steel, steel within the man comes out, that's what it looks like. Well, of course, needless to say, Harry Oppenheimer hated the painting. 
<laughs> well, not hated it. He was polite about it, as one would be. But uh, I, it ended up in the boardroom of the beers in, Johann and he's in, in London, where I think it's now used to uh, uh, scare off people wanting to do a takeover bread. Okay. <laughs> this is a drawing I did for a, an idea about freedom. I took that from Byron's Child Harold. He, this is, a, in a way, 25 years of his, this Harold's pilgrimage. And I asked myself, what should he and Mandela share? Probably freedom, the concept of freedom. And I got that from those two lines, yet freedom, yet thy banner torn but flying, screams like the thunderstorm against the wind. That's what they shared. It was my pleasure to build a building and work with him over that year. Thank you. And that's sort of a model of a monument to freedom.